everybody join this evening. Let us get a little situated here and we can go to our Father in prayer. I am who you say I am. I can do all things through Christ. Your word is alive and active in me. Gracious Father, creator of the heavens and the earth, and the fullness thereof, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, all there is, all there was, all there will be, the Almighty. Father, we ask you to forgive us for we all fall in short of your will and your glory. Shine your face upon us that we may be saved. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We thank you for your grace, mercy, and love, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, joy, peace, and purity, courage, strength, and healing, abundance, awareness, and expansion. But most of all, Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus, who went to the cross on Calvary shed his blood for the remission of our sin and salvation of our soul. Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit that abides with us each and every day, leading us and guiding us through the way you would have us to go. Now, Father, thank you for being here tonight. I ask you to speak to me, speak through me. Remove my ego. Let me speak the words that you would have me to speak tonight, Father. Speak through me, edifying souls tonight, Father. Touch us in the name of Yeshua Hamasih that we may be blessed of you this evening, Father, in the name of Yeshua HaMessiah. Amen, amen, amen. All right. We have gone through the epistles of John. One John, two John, and three John. And over the course of going through the epistles of John, we have had 12 lessons. Fellowship and forgiveness being the first one, followed by talking and walking in the truth. The third lesson was encouragement and warning. The fourth lesson, how important is theology? Followed by like father, like son. Then we have blessed assurance, discernment, and devotion. Then we have fear's remedy. Then in lesson number nine, we learned that faith is victory. Number 10, we found out what we know as Christians. And then last Wednesday, we talked about truth and love. Tonight, we talked about opening our hearts and our homes. There are some points that have been uh, present in each lesson that I want to lift out right now so that we are on the same sheet of music. One of the first lessons that we should have, that's been present in each thing that we talked about is align ourselves with the Spirit. Not being satellite Christians, only tuning in once, to it, once a week but having a continual connection with the Father. And we have that continual connection with the Father through our love of one another. That brings us to the horizontal love that is brought on by the vertical love. <coughs> How can we have vertical love without horizontal love? We show our vertical love to God by how we love one another which brings us to fellowship. In order to truly show love, we got to fellowship with each other one way or another. We must fellowship. And then the point that John drove home in each and every lesson that he wrote, in each letter that he wrote was, 
the acceptance of Christ as the Son of God. There's no other way that we can get to the Father but through the Son. And in order to have the joy and the fellowship and the connection to the Father, we must accept Christ as his Son. Then, the last point that I want to bring out, that he wants us not to receive those who reject Christ as the Son of God. In other words, we need to reject those who reject Jesus Christ. So, our lesson tonight, opening our hearts and our homes. The author writes, imagine living in a world where there's no bed and breakfast, no hotels and head waiters. If traveling evangelism teachers were to come to your town, you would have the privilege of inviting them into your home for the night and giving them provisions for their journey. Such was the world of John and his readers. Their hospitality was one of the clearest testimonies of their love for the brethren and obedience to God. The same is true today. The same is true today. Showing love to our brothers and showing hospitality. One of the hardest things we one of the hardest things we do as people, period, is showing hospitality. We don't just let anybody get close to us. We don't want everybody getting close to us. And that's a good thing because we don't know what everybody is about. But when we start rejecting those that we know what they're about, when we know that they mean they have our best interests in mind, then we have a problem. So the question, first question that comes to mind, when is showing hospitality difficult? And I mean, that's an easy answer. It's, it's hard to show hospitality to somebody that's hostile to you. Nobody wants to open up their home to anybody that has mistreated you, that slandered your name, talked about you, lied on you, any of that. You don't want to open your home to that. That's, that's, that's understandable. And then because of the way the world is today, we can't be too sure of who we are allowing in our homes. We sometimes think we have allowed some good people around us only to find out we've entertained something completely different from what we thought or who we thought we were entertaining. And so those are some times that it's very difficult to show hospitality. Even, even in your passing on the highway, you see someone broke down on the side of the road. You're hesitant to stop and help because there are so many people that are doing things that when you are stopped to help someone, you become a victim. And nobody wants to become a victim. All right? So then the question comes to mind, how have you benefited from someone extending you hospitality? A meal? A place to sleep? Here at St. Fredericks, we have extended hospitality in some ways that I had never seen before. Uh, there, there are some people who have come through here who have uh, been given access to showering. Uh, Pastor Perry built showers for people to shower, opened up the outside so people could have a place to stay when they couldn't stay anyplace else. The hospitality is going above and beyond not to mention the mission outreach program that we run. The first, third, and fifth Saturdays of each month, we feed people here in the community. We buy Meals on Wheels. The church is open every Tuesday and Thursday to feed people that are hungry within the community. And then our outreach program now covers six counties. We go as far north or far east as Bell County and as far southwest South, southwest as Hayes County, where we are providing food for people that are hungry. So our hospitality here as a body of believers in St. Frederick's is one that is outstanding. Better late than never, brother. Better, better late than never. Glad you can make it. Glad you can make it. 
So, opening our hearts and our homes. John, writing to the churches again. He sent a little note letting them know that um, how he felt about some things going on. John sent a note to his very good friend Gaius. Let's back up. Let's go to 3 John and read the scripture first. As you can see, I'm a little excited about this lesson. So let's back up and read the scripture so y'all know well, you should have your swords drawn and your word available to know what I'm talking about anyway. But anyway, 3 John. To dear guys whom I love in truth. And there you go with that again, in truth. Dear friend, I'm praying that everything prosper with you and that you be in good health, as I know you are prospering spiritually. For I was happy when some brothers came and testified how faithful you are to the truth, as you continue living in the truth. Nothing gives me greater joy than hearing that my children are living in the truth. Dear friend, you are faithful in all the work that you're doing for the brothers, even when they are strangers to you. They have testified to your love in front of the congregation. You will be doing well if you send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. Since it was for the sake of Hashim that they were sent out without accepting anything from the Goyim, it is we, therefore, who should support such people so that they may share in their work for the truth. I wrote something to the congregation, but the Atrephus, who likes to be the mocker among them, doesn't recognize our authority. So I come, I will bring up everything he is doing including his spiteful and groundless gossip about us. And if that, that weren't enough, he refuses to recognize the brother, the brother's authority either. Moreover, he stopped those who want to do, do so and tries to drive them out the congregation. Dear friend, don't imitate the bad, but the good. Those who do what is good are from God. Those who do what are bad, not from God. Everyone speaks well of Demetrius, and so does the truth itself. We vouch for him, and you know what our testimony, that our testimony is true. I have much to write to you, but I don't want to write with pen and ink. However, I am hoping to see you very soon, and we will speak face to face. Shalom to you. you your friends send you their greetings. Greet each other our friends by name. A couple words I need to uh, define for you real quick. Hashim, that is the name. The name, meaning the name of God who we travel in. Goyim means the Gentiles. Marker means preeminent. One to be number one, the top dog. One to be recognized for all that he does. He was more interested in himself than he was the word of God. Talking about Diotrephus. Diotrephus. Let's go with that one. Diotrephus. So, as we see, John sent out another letter to the churches, commending a couple of them, and correcting, or trying to correct one of them, who refused correction. So to the church, Gaius was most likely a church leader. He prays that his friend prays for his friend in prosperity in every way, and he's doing good in health, just as his whole life is going well. But this could also be translated the way he said it. It could always also be translated just as your soul prospers. Again, what he said about him. In the beginning, in the first uh, two verses there, I am praying that everything possible with you and that you are in good health as I know you are prospering spiritually. 
that could be translated just as your soul prospers. All right? Now, this particular verse has been used to uh, try to promote prosperity ministry. Brother Hank talked about this the other day, mentioned it, prosperity ministry. And they try to use these verses to promote that, but it's not, it's not what that is for. He, this is talking about how we are growing in the spirit, how we are doing well in Christ, not how we are making money or how healthy we are. Now, there's absolutely nothing wrong with being in good health. There's absolutely nothing wrong with having money. Matter of fact, we should be working toward where we work at, doing our best to get the best promotion we can get and taking care of our health, being as fit as possible. When we are physically fit, we are able to do more. We don't have to complain. We don't have to lay around. We're not sick. We're not hurting. And we're able to do more to advance the kingdom. But when we're not well, we're not physically fit, we're not able to advance the kingdom as well as we should. Now the problem is when we take this as a prosperity doctrine and, and use it toward prosperity ministry, we put things in the wrong perspective. We stop looking at our soul prospering. We're looking at how we prosper in this world. That is without spiritual development whatsoever. We're no longer concerned about how our soul is growing, how we're growing as a, a child of God. We're concerned about what's in my pocket, how I look, and how I feel. And all those things don't matter if we're not helping somebody to get better in their selves. When we get caught up in that, our motivations will lead us into a hollow, empty life. How many times do we look at TV and we see the rich and famous who are not happy, they got all the money, they got the greatest looking bodies, whatever you want to say, but they're not happy. And they're not happy because their souls are not prospering, they're not growing on the inside. Everything is happening on the external and nothing is happening on the internal. And if nothing's happening on the internal, that means there's no work being done toward the eternal. All right? So how could John know, how could John see that Gaius was prospering? How could he possibly know that? It wasn't because of the material wealth that he had gained, but it was because of fellow believers testifying about his fidelity testifying how he worked, testifying about the work that he did and the truth and how he lived. What is the testimony that we offer? Want to know about yourself? Listen. What do people say about you? What is the report of others about you? Is the report a good report, or is the report a report that says that you need to do some work? How do we measure success as our, in our believer's walk? Spiritual well-being, or are we not walking in the truth? Our spiritual well-being should reflect where we are. In other words, if we're living up to God's word, then it's easy to see where we are. That would be the testimony of other people. That would be the testimony that's about you. All right? And John was happy to say that he got great joy by hearing the testimony of his friend Gaius. Now, in the previous lesson, we talked about the need for the church to support believers and not to accept outsiders who reject Christ as the Son of God. We are supposed to support those and do what is right in the eyes of God for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ. In other words, we accept the evangelists, 
the missionaries, the teachers, the church planners, and all the such who are doing the will of God. But as stated in the last lesson, those who are not doing the will of God, we don't need to give them our blessing. We don't need to give them shalom. We don't need to give them peace at all. But the ones that are doing the work of God, we are to provide financial assistance, hospitality, encouragement, and y'all pray for a brother. Make sure y'all pray for a brother. Pray for our pastor because he has a lot of work that he has to do. He got to deal with us. Pray for our pastor. And then pray for our co-workers in Christ. Pray for our co-workers in Christ. In Christ. We don't all have the same job, but we all have a job. The body, is, the body has many members. And each member has his own function. All right? Now, Gaius did not, Gaius showed his love when he accepted people from the outside who were traveling. No bed or breakfast, no hotels, none of that stuff was available. But Gaius made sure that folks that were moving around in the name of Jesus were taken care of. Now, the beauty about that is, if we do that today, just like Gaius was recognized, God recognizes our efforts to support the kingdom. And um, we talk about rusty halo, woolly robe, and a skinny white cloud. Well, you got an account in heaven. And every time that you do the will of God, you're depositing in that account. So when you take care of the workers of God, you are depositing in that account. And when you reject the work of God, well, you're making some big withdrawals. All right? Gaius was faithful in his leadership and committed to the truth. But everybody, everybody ain't the same. We talked about that other brother, Diotrephus. He wanted to be first. He wanted to be number one, the top dog, the center of attention, king of the hill. He, he just wanted nobody to do nothing unless they recognized him first. It was all about him. This brother went so far that he even rejected John's authority. John was handpicked. Not some Johnny come lately, but John was handpicked by Christ himself to be an apostle and to write scripture. Yet, Brother D just decided that he was going to do his own thing because I'm, I'm, I'm Pastor D. I'm going to do what I want to do. We're going to do it the way I say do it. And anything, anybody else don't want to do it, don't want to follow what I'm saying, hit the bricks. As a matter of fact, he would throw folks out of the congregation for trying to assist traveling brothers. He would excommunicate people. The brother D had, he just wouldn't listen. He was blatant in his disrespect and rejection of the truth. To make matters worse and to throw much more, to heap some more on his sins, he slandered. He talked bad about John and John's brothers with malicious words and, and, and as well as throwing folks out to church because they wanted to do the right thing. He just did not do what was right. Now we run across some folks like that today. We run across some churches where you go in, you have a pastor that's um, a lot like Brother D. He's a tyrant, oppressor, totalitarian, authoritarian, an autocrat, uh, self-centered, all those things. As opposed to Brother Gaius who was supportive and worked with people passing through, Brother D slammed the door in their face and rejected it. In his mind, Brother D's mind, there was no other truth than his own. I don't care if Jesus Christ did pick you. I'm the pastor of this church. These are my followers. We're going to do it my way. 
but you know, good old brother John, he he uh, wasn't scared to call him out. As soon as I get through doing what I'm doing, I'm coming to see you. We gonna talk about this. But you're not doing the right thing and you're misleading people. And John was so, so happy with what Brother Gaius was doing that he encouraged him and the encouragement carries over to us today. Not to imitate the evil that was being done by Diotrephus. Diotrephus. Okay? Not to imitate Brother D's lack of respect and understanding of who Jesus Christ truly is. Not to lean to your own understanding, his own understanding, and not to try to just do what it is he felt like doing. Brother D is an example, an obvious example of what not to be. If you find yourself at a church, in a church home, where you got a tyrant, a dictator, oppressor, someone telling you that this is the only way that things may be done, it would be wise for you to look for another church home. But wouldn't he have at least pretended to be righteous for his followers? Well, think about it. You would think he would pretend to be righteous, but if you are brand new to something and you don't know, and that's where a lot of people get people, it's because you're new to something, you don't know better. You only know what I teach you. And if I teach you that I, let's use North Korea for an example, for lack of, for lack of anything else. Let's use North Korea as an example. Kim Jong-un has that whole country believing that he is a supreme being. They don't have any outside information coming in to know otherwise. So all they know is that this man is our supreme leader. He's the greatest thing that walked on earth. And all we know is that he's going to make sure that we get some crumbs because he certainly ain't feeding them. He's giving them the lease. So why does he have to pretend to be righteous when that's all that they know? Look, smell, and taste good, they'd be happy. Pastor said, if it looks, smell, and taste good, they would be happy. And that's what they were getting. Something that looked good, smelled good, and tasted good, and they didn't know any better. Okay? That's why Pastor tells us daily, need it for yourself. Don't take nobody's word for the word. We talked about this last lesson. I can take out a word, I can slip in the word. The illusions, the illusions. We can make anything fit whatever we want to make it fit. The illusion of being the truth. It only takes one slight to get you, it takes one degree to get you off 15 miles over a long, long stretch of the way. So if you off a little bit and you've been on this journey for a long time, you got a lot of unlearning to do because there are some things that you've done that you did out of ignorance. You didn't mean to hurt nobody. You didn't mean to mislead anybody. But because you didn't know, you propagated a lot. All right? So then he spoke of Demetrius. Demetrius was one that had consistency in his life. His life matched the scriptures. His life matched the scriptures. When we see a word, and when we see word and deed lining up together, alignment, as we talked about, then that's a leader that we can follow. But when we got leadership that is telling us A, B, and C, but they live in H, I, and J, it don't match. Pastor said, run. I would agree. You run. If they tell you A, B, and C, but they live in something completely different, it does not match up. All right? One who does good is of God. The one who does good is of God. All right? 
And then we get to verses 15, 13 through 15. John makes a point of letting them know once again, I want to see you face to face. There's joy in fellowship. There's joy in communion. When we get together, we can have a good time. Um, today, you know, literally today, we are communicating. Y'all see me, but I can't see you, but I know you're there. Me and Pastor are fellowshipping. We are fellowshipping, but we're not fellowshipping. We can get some joy, but we don't get all the joy because of the virus that has us separated right now. And even looking at it, the way we are going, I can communicate with you here, I can text you, I can email you, I can give you a warning over the, over the web, however we do it, or I can encourage you over the web, however we do it. But it's not the same if I sit down or stand and look you in your face, or you stand and look me in my face and speak the truth. We can hide behind technology, but when you look me in my face, it's very hard for me to say something that is not the truth. My body is going to give away the lies that I'm telling. Your body is going to give away the lies that are being told. Our bodies don't lie. We can say anything, but our body language is going to tell the truth. All right? So, let's get into our lesson. I probably should have wrote this down a long time ago. Note the emphasis again on loving someone in truth. In verses 1 and 2, he goes back to loving in truth. Why must our love for fellow Christians be bound by the bond of truth? Why must our love for fellow Christians be bound by the bond of truth? And then, how have you seen this to be true in your own experience? I have you found this to be true. Because Yahshua, Yahshua is the truth. When you walk in the truth, you walk with Yahshua. Amen. Yep. Amen. All right. I mean, think about it when uh, it says, love for our fellow Christians be bound by the truth, knowing that our Father lives in us. Uh, and so if our Father lives in us, then we are all Christians then we're not lying to a human being, we're lying to our Father also. And 
have I seen this to be true? Yes. We must love the spirit of truth. Amen. Amen. Alright. So why is God is such a good example of us for us to be following? For us to follow in the Christian life. Why is Gaius a good example for us? What did Gaius do? What did Gaius do? Nobody? Nobody? Guy is fed him, gave him some place. What verses are we covering? The whole book. Uh, right now, we are still in verses 2 and 4. 2 through 4. Verses 2 through 4. Dear friend, I am praying that you prosper with everything prosper with you and that you be in good health as I know you are prospering spiritually. For I was happy when some brothers came and testified how faithful you are to the truth as you continue living in truth. Nothing gives me greater joy than hearing that my children are living in truth. And I'm reading again from the complete Jewish Bible. Guys receive strangers and treat them like brothers. Amen. Amen. All right. So what does it mean for us to be walking in truth? What does it mean for us to be walking in truth? Verses 3 and 4. Verses 3 and 4. For I was so happy when some brothers came and testified how faithful you are to the truth as you continue living in the truth. Nothing gives me greater joy than hearing that my children are living in the truth. Walking in the truth is to walk in the way that she walk. We are a living testimony of his salvation. All right. All right. We are a living testimony of his salvation. And we go back 
we go back a few lessons to uh, lesson number five. Like father, like son. And if we are a part of that branch, there should be some recognition of our father in us. You should be able to recognize our father within us. All right. So how are both love and faithfulness demonstrated in Christian hospitality? Verses 5 and 6. Dear friend, you are faithful in all the work you're doing for the brothers, even when they are strangers to you. Hank already answered the question. They have testified to your love in front of the congregation. You will be doing well if you send them away in a manner worthy of God. What, what was going on there? How are both love and faithfulness demonstrated in Christian hospitality? What should we be doing in Christian hospitality? As a body, I named a few things that we do. Every Tuesday and Thursday, every first, third, and fifth Saturday of the month, we now reach over six counties where we are serving food to the hungry, showing hospitality the best way that we can. And not to mention the work that Pastor does with Mission Marble Falls on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Five to six days a week, this body is involved in feeding people. Basic hospitality. Christian hospitality is selfish, is a selfless act. What we do for the least of our brothers, because in doing so, we are caring for Yeshua himself. Amen. Amen. All right. So what does it mean for us to show hospitality in a manner worthy of God? In a manner worthy of God. What will you offer God? I'm going to steal, steal another one of the pastor's lines. You going to serve him on a dirty plate? It's the God in them that we're showing hospitality to. Okay, we're showing the hospitality of God in them, yeah. But what does it mean for us to show hospitality in a manner worthy of our God? Would you serve, if you had the opportunity to serve Jesus Christ himself, what would you give him, Hank? Matter of fact, not just Hank. What would anybody that's listening right now give Yeshua, Hamasiah, Shasalom, Jesus Christ, if he were in your presence right now? What would you offer him? If he walked in your house, 
what would you offer him? If he, everything. Everything. All right? So if he came to spend the night at your house, means don't turn away anyone, as Jesus never turned away anyone. Be of open heart and mind to give what you can to help those who come to you and me. Amen. All right. So in other words, if we are giving in the name of God, if we are giving in the name of Christ, we are giving the best that we have. It might not be much, but if Christ came to spend the night at your house, how many are you going to put him in your kid's bedroom? How many are you going to give him the couch? How many are you going to put him out in the garage? You're going to give him the best that you have. And if you're sleeping on a cot, and that's the best that you have, you're going to get up off that cot, and you're going to offer it to your Lord. Or at least you should. It is up to him to accept it or reject it. But you need to offer it. If all you got is beans and weenies, you offer him the best beans and weenies in Texas. If that means putting your foot in to make him taste better, that's what you do. He can have the California King bedroom. Amen. All right. Why do you think Christian workers are to look for support? Look to support Christians. Let me read that again. Why do you think Christian workers are to look for Christians for support and not non-Christians? I will put him in my bed and I will sleep on the couch. Amen. All right. So keep that in mind next time you have a visitor that comes by. If you don't have a special guest room that's set up for visitors where they can sleep confident, comfortable, comfortably, give up that bed. You sleep on the couch. If my mother were alive and she showed up at my house and my room was, and I did not have the guest room set up right, she gets my bed. All right? So why should we be looking for help from our, Chris, our brothers and sisters and not from non-Christians. Verses 7 and 8. Verses 7 and 8. Since it's for the sake of the Hashim, the name, they went out without accepting anything from Goyim, Gentiles. It is we, therefore, who should support such people so that, that we may share in their work for the truth. Remember I said Hashim is for the name of Christ. Goyim is about Gentiles. For the sake of his name. How can a non-Christian truly support a Christian in his work. If we don't have the same understanding, we don't have the same knowledge, we don't have the same wisdom and understanding, how can they support you in the work that you're doing? They can provide you a place to stay temporarily, but if that place to stay is a place that is not in line with where we should be staying, it is going to cause us some issues. If you are a traveling evangelist and you come up on a place where you need help, the last place you really ought to be hanging out and spending your time is a place where they're doing everything that you are preaching against. Unless, of course, that's where God sent you in the first place to evangelize in that place. All right? And that is very possible that you're traveling and you get stuck. And in your getting stuck, there comes another mission. You left with one mission, but the mission changed in progress, in the process. And in the process of the mission changing, 
you got a new assignment. And in that case, you do the work that you need to do while you're there, and then you continue on with your assignment. But we don't set out to go where people that are not like us, that are not peculiar, that are not called to do the work. We don't set out to go hang out with those people. We are supposed to be with people with a like mind and on one accord. can open doors that you don't want to open. Amen. They cannot help you because they don't know Jesus. Thank you, Sister Kennedy. Other Christians have the foundations of Christ and his word. They will be able to reinforce you in areas where you are weaker. As Christians, we must be ready and able to support and lift each other up when we are down where we are and face the storm together. Thank you, Brother Jason. One cord can hold up. But if we look in the book of, I believe it is, Ecclesiastics 4 and 12, it tells us bound as a threefold cord. A threefold cord is not easily broken. A threefold cord is not easily broken. So if we are, if we are bound together, if there's three of us, that means that we are as the witnesses, as we talked about a couple of lessons ago, the witnesses, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the three witnesses, the number three, manifestation, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, yes, yeah, yeah, the three, the three, wrapped as a threefold cord, which is not easily broken. Three days, Christ went down, and he rose again and ascended back to heaven. It can also get your message associated with the negative things that they're doing. Mm. Now, you can be the most upright person in the world. Mm -hmm. Your intent is clean. Everything is fair on the up and up. But what people don't know, they will make up. How many times did the Sadducees and the Pharisees say, hey, why are you hanging out with those sinners? They accused the Lord himself. So what's going to happen to us? We pick up our cross and follow him. He got accused. We're going to get accused. And we are seen in places we ought not be seen. We're going to get that label. Um, and the Bible says somewhere, Avoid the very appearance of evil. Avoid the very appearance. While we are doing the right thing, because the world does not know what God has intended, they will twist it, they will flip it, and take what God has ordained and try to sully it up, try to make it look bad because they don't know what's going on. God can send you someplace to do something, to see somebody and do his work. The world is already trying to get the message and twist it. So we have to avoid that very appearance, all right? Let's talk about old brother D. If we desire to be first, how would that conflict with our ability to be loved? If we always desire to be first, how would that conflict with our ability to be loved? How will that conflict with our ability to be loved? Let me put Pastor Perry on the spot. Mm -hmm. Did you just 
Shooting minutes for the strip club. Mm. <laughs> Pole dancers have souls too. But hey man, you're right. You're absolutely right. But pole dancers do have souls. Now, we are, as men of God, supposed to be able to go anywhere. We are supposed to be able to go anywhere and come out the same way we went in. All right? If you are given the task to minister in a strip club, you better know that you know that you know that that's where you're being sent to minister. That would not be a circumstance that I would suggest for anybody. This takes me back. I'm glad you said that. This takes me back some years. When I uh, first decided to well, I didn't decide. When it became apparent and clear that I had to answer my call in the ministry, people who focus on being first or best step on others to boost themselves and look down on others, they stop loving others and begin to love the possibility of them being first and above all others. Amen. Amen. Well, let's get back to ministering in the strip club. Back in 19, ooh, something, 92, 91, 92, when I began to accept my calling to ministry, I had some friends that I hung out with, and one of my friends owned a strip club. Another one owned a martial arts school. And we were all just hanging out there. And uh, while we were there, I had told them that was going to be my last day hanging out with them because my ministry was about to go into effect. And while I was there, there was a young man who spoke to me. And while we were in our conversation, I told him, I have been called into the ministry, and this is what I'm going to do. And of course, the brother looked at me and said, what you doing here? Well, apparently, I needed to talk to him that night. But that's not why I went there. I went there with my buddies, because that was going to be the last time we got a chance to hang out in that environment. But while I was there, I witnessed to somebody that was in a strip club. And this has been a good... 27, 28 years ago. And when you mentioned that, Hank, that brought that back to my memory. So you can minister anywhere. And you should be able to go out the same way you came in. All right? Wow. That was a buried memory. But I have been down that road, and you can minister anywhere. Got to be God's set, though. Yeah. Pastor said, you got to be God sent. Which makes me think about the seven sons of Sceva. They out there trying to cast out devils. And the devils looked at them and said, Jesus we know. Paul we know. Who are y'all? <laughs> Had them brothers running up and down the street naked. If you go off into a place that you have not been sent by God, have not been anointed by the Holy Spirit, you may not come out naked. Literally. But you will be naked when you leave there. Your spirit is going to get hit such a way. Your, 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 your mind is going to get hit such a way. You will have so much doubt in your ability and your standing with Christ that you're going to lose footing. So if you do that, make sure you know that you know that you know that you were sent there by your father and not by somebody else's father. Now, in contrast to Brother D., Demetrius was well spoken of by everyone in verse 12. If those who know you best are asked about your love and hospitality, what might they say? If somebody came and asked me about 
Brother Hank. How is his love and hospitality? What 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 would be my response? Yeah, he don't want you to minister in the strip club. That's one thing we know for sure. He don't want you to put yourself in a situation that you are not ready for. All right, we know that about Brother Hank. We know Sister Kennedy's gonna give you an uplifting word every time she can. We know Brother Jason gonna help us out as much as he can when he can. We know Pastor Perry ain't gonna let nobody be hungry. You can be anything you want to around him, but you will not be hungry. We know Deacon Jackson gonna fuss about everything that's going on around him, but you won't be hungry. He gonna make sure you got something to eat. He might be fussing while he fix your plate, but he gonna feed you. Amen. Sister Jackson gonna correct you in love every time she see you off base. So if you off base, don't hang around Sister Jackson. Cause she gonna love you like she's supposed to. Remember, truth without love is cold, just, just, just nasty. Then love without truth is sentimentalism and excessive use of kind, flowery words that have no meaning because there's no truth in it. All right? So, what would they say about your hospitality and love? What would people say about your hospitality and love? Verse What might they say? What might they say? Really? Well, if somebody gave testimony of me, I believe they would say I'm good. 
I don't want nobody hungry around me. I do what I can to help anybody that I can. And I try to live up to the word of God. You cash your check on the other side. All right. All right. It's a good way to do it. Let somebody else give your testimony, which is fine. That's good. All right. So, in light of this passage, since you'd rather not say, what can you do to develop a ministry of hospitality? What can you do to develop a better ministry of hospitality? Knowing what we do as a church body already. And you know, for such a small group of people, we get a lot done. The shepherd sets the tone for what we do. The love and the kindness that is shown by him, for the most part, I can say is reflected in the congregation. Now there are some of us who still have some mean streaks. And when I say some of us, I'm only talking about one that I truly know. Or oh, there are several times, matter of fact, I told him this week, that's why you the pastor. Because he opens his heart and he does the right thing because it's the right thing. We talked about doing the right thing and the loving thing in our last lesson. He does it because it's the right thing. It's the loving thing. Sometimes if he did the thing that was right, there would be some people with some hurt feelings. But he's doing the loving thing, showing kindness, where kindness is not necessarily due. But that's why he is our shepherd. Because I know two of us would tell some people no in a heartbeat. But that's why he is our shepherd. Does anyone have anything else on this? That concludes our lesson. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Perry. Amen. This is a good one. And opening our hearts and homes. We need to keep in mind that the house that you have, whether it's a one bedroom apartment, or three bedroom, two bedroom, or a great big old ranch, realize that it does not belong to you. You just barn it for a short while. It belongs to our Father. He has blessed you with what you have. I, 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 I tell folks all the time and they look at me like I'm crazy because everything that I have in my refrigerator, food that we have here at the church in the deep freeze, doesn't belong to St. Frederick. It don't belong to me. It belongs to God. We are supposed to open our hearts and help one another. Now, I, I'm not going to tell you that I got a whole lot of money that I can go out and buy you something all the time. But I can tell you that I can dig in that deep freeze <laughs> and make sure you got a full bed so that when you leave, you're not hungry, not for food anyway, and not for the word, because we're going to talk about the Lord. 
the worldly stuff you made, when you come to me, you're going to be in trouble because I, I ain't in it. It's all about our Father. We belong to our Father. The things that we have belong to our Father. He gave it to us to use, to handle. And as our lesson says, opening our heart. That if you can't open your heart, that means you have a stony heart. If you ever tried to pick up a big old rock and open it up, impossible. It's going to break. It ain't going to open. It's going to break. But if you take something soft, if you take an apple or peach, you're able to peel it open. And that is what we need. We need that heart of flesh. We need that loving heart. And opening our homes to somebody. Help somebody out. I am I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give you a challenge because it's saying opening our hearts and our homes. Now, I know we got COVID, so I'm not going to tell you to invite this in and everybody in your home. But if Thanksgiving coming up, if you're like me, I enjoy it just so I can have something to eat. I'm not worried about nothing else. I just, just to eat. It's just a day to eat. I challenge you, somebody out there needs a plate. And I challenge you to give somebody a plate off of your table from the love of your heart. Now, I'm not saying wait till you're done eating and you gather all the straps and you take out. But I'm saying giving your best. Uh, whether it's from the beginning or from the middle. Offer your best. Not no measly scraps. Open your heart. Help somebody out. There shouldn't be anybody this holiday season that's sleeping under the bridge, sleeping in their cars, that shouldn't have a good meal. We throw away that each holiday because it sat in the refrigerator too long as fall. Open your hearts. Help somebody out. If you say they got a pocket full of money, they don't need my help, oh well. That's between them and the Lord. You've done your part. Let's do as John has wrote here in this letter. Be a faithful servant. Open your heart to somebody. Show them the love that is within you. God bless you all. Amen. Amen. All right, our next lesson, Wednesday, we begin a walk through the books of Peter. We'll start with 1 Peter 1, and we'll go to uh, second chapter, the third verse. Ransom by grace. Ransom by grace. Does anybody have anything for me? All hearts and minds clear. All hearts and minds clear. We've been given a challenge to feed somebody from your table for Thanksgiving. Giving your best, not your scraps. So now, let us go to our Father in prayer, praying for an open heart that will lead to an open home. 
God, our Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for the time that we spent together. Father, thank you for speaking to me and speaking through me. Lord, I love you, Lord, I need you, Lord, I can't live without you. Thank you for touching hearts, souls, and minds this evening, Father. We ask you to continue to bless and keep each and every one of us. Bless each and every person that is listening to this tonight, Father. Touch their homes, open their hearts, open their homes to fellowship and love, Father, in the name of Yeshua HaMasir. Amen, amen, and amen. Good night, all.